Can you hear me? Before you record, um, can you please let Sheila know that Jada Rinpoche is available? Not right now, because he doesn't have internet. So I'll get in touch with Rinpoche whenever he's got internet. So that'd be around the 27th or 29th, uh, 28th. Yes. Of, Sorry. of May? Of May? Yes, of May. Yes. Okay. So it's thank just you a few so much. days. Rinpoche just doesn't have internet right now. Just okay, to thank you. Know. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, sorry for that. I just need to pass on a message. Okay, got it. Great, thank you. Well, I just want to make one quick announcement before we start. Um, we won't have class next, next week um, because, well, a long time ago, I agreed to give a teaching to a center in, in Vienna just for the day. So that wouldn't be so much of a problem but then the next day I have to translate for Yandir Rinpoche uh, in Toshita so it'll just be too much which is why I decided this is the third time it's the last time we'll cancel class but yeah so we won't have class um, next Sunday. Okay. I will write uh, I will uh, write it down on the website and please wait so, so we'll meet on the, on the fifth next time. That's right. So June the 5th, if that's, yeah, if it's June the 5th. All right, great. So no class next week. I'll repeat it. I'll, I'll say it again um, before, we'll, before we'll end today. But yeah, just for you to know. Okay, so let's start with some breathing. That is breathing meditation, of course. And visualize in the space in front of you. The Buddha is appearing in the form of a fully ordained monk. As an emanation of all the enlightened qualities. And it's inseparable from your lama or your lamas. And as always, he is surrounded by all the great masters contained enlightenment or high realizations for practicing the Buddha's teachings. All spontaneously appearing in the space in front of you. Masters from India, from Tibet, and all the other traditions. Serving as an object of refuge, but also as, a, as examples and inspiration. our own practice. Yeah. 
And as always, we are surrounded by all sentient beings. All of them having the same potential to become enlightened, yet controlled by their obstructions, or misapprehension of reality and other afflictions. Experiencing incredible suffering And that's then focused on all these sentient beings first. We awaken our affectionate love. A feeling of closeness and affection towards each and every one of those beings deep feeling of care. Based on the understanding of their potentials, a sense of acceptance. Knowing that they can all change and will change eventually. And then your affectionate love, it gives way to great compassion that focuses specifically on the suffering, all the other limitations and their causes. That sentient beings have to endure right now. And with this deep sense of affection, generate the aspiration, may they be free from all their suffering and its causes. And all their limitations in general. And may I be able to lead them away from all these problems, limitations, and so forth. May I free them from whatever keeps them from becoming liberated or even enlightened. And then allow yourself, allow that aspiration to grow stronger and turn into a determination to do whatever is necessary to free sentient beings from all their suffering and its causes and from all their limitations. Since that is only possible once we become enlightened ourselves, generate the aspiration to become fully enlightened. 
in order to fulfill your main aspiration. To lead sentient beings to a state free from all obscurations. And remember that it's also with this aspiration, with this mind of enlightenment, of bodhicitta, that we'll today continue to study. Chandrakirti's text. And then without letting go of bodhicitta, let's recite the prayers together. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. And may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. Focus specifically on the Buddha and the great master surrounding the Buddha. Reverently I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time. And rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence. And turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of others to the great enlightenment. Okay. All right. Okay, so for this coming week, um, for two weeks really, as I will say again towards the end of this class, we'll want to pass next week, so it's really for two weeks. Um, Focus, of course, once again on the mind of enlightenment. And since you've got two weeks, well, uh, for next Sunday, or whenever you've got time, use Shanti Deva's Bodhisattva way of life to strengthen your love, compassion, of course, that are the driving forces for your mind of enlightenment. And in that way, strengthen, of course, your mind of enlightenment. So no class next week, but work. Okay, so please uh, take the time to read Shantideva's Bodhisattva Way of Life, whichever chapter, well, you feel like you need to focus on more, 
uh, whether it's patience or whatever else it may be. All right. And then, of course, there's also the wisdom aspect I'd like you to combine with your practice of bodhicitta. Now we leave behind, we leave behind the first type of selflessness or the understanding that there is no permanent, no partless and no independent self. But while well, having done that, there's a, a subtler type of selflessness that well, we need to focus on for this coming week. It's not emptiness yet. It's not talking about the lack of an inherently existent self, which goes even deeper. Um, but it's definitely a subtler type of selflessness, subtler than the fact that the self doesn't exist uh, as a permanent, partless, independent entity. Subtler means it's just harder to understand that. And our sense of self, our unrealistic sense of self, it manifests in different ways. Sometimes there's just a sense of this separate uh, entity that is permanent, at least. I mean, innately, we definitely have that sense. Of course, intellectually acquired, there's also that sense, possibly. But um, at other times, there's a sense of a more subtler type of self, which is described as a self-sufficient, substantially existent self. Okay, so it's a very wordy. Many of you are familiar with this terminology, but just in case you aren't. So the sense that there is a self-sufficient, substantially existent self. And really the meaning of self-sufficient and substantially existent is, uh, well, explained by many masters, by many scholars to be the same. Sometimes his holiness, for instance, says self-sufficient in the sense of substantially existent. So what does that mean? What do these words really refer to? It refers to our mind perceiving a type of self that doesn't necessarily have to be totally independent of mind and body. No, it doesn't mean that, especially when it's innate, when that mind that innately, that is naturally arises for anyone, you know, whether animals or humans, a naturally arising mind is such that there is no sense that the I is separate, but that the I is definitely an entity that controls mind and body. Okay, it's this still, it's something, it's an entity that is not just labeled, but there is this I that controls mind and body, that utilizes mind and body and also other objects around it. And that is such that you could actually identify it if you, i mean the sense it's just a sense that you could identify it without having to rely on mind and body you could actually identify it although it's dependent on them but if you you could theoretically you could actually get at the eye understand the eye without having to rely on mind and body and furthermore there's the explanation that this type of the sense of there's this separate entity called the i it goes as far as uh that the as, as the mind thinking that i could actually exchange myself with the self of another person so it's the sense of like the self it can be compared to a merchant a salesperson a merchant and his goods in that the self is exchangeable. You could exchange. So sometimes we may have the wish if we admire someone greatly, there's the wish, oh, may I be this person? May I have their mind and their body? If you kind of admire someone greatly and you would really like to be them. So having their mental and physical qualities. So the sense you could actually swap, you could swap with them. You could switch places with that person, like a merchant can switch, can kind of swap goods, right? Like can kind of exchange them, whatever, whatever they, they, they have. So without using money as such, or even using money, exchanging money for some goods, for instance, um, in that way, the sense that we could actually do that. All right. So that sense of a separate entity, it's not getting at inherent existence yet, but rather saying there's the separate I. And that's how it feels a lot of the time. I mean, really when we, especially in situations, of course, when uh, we take something personally, when we're um, insulted by something, when we're embarrassed, when we're praised, 
certain emotional states that are the result, well, of insult, praise, being wrongly accused of something, and so forth. And that's in that in those situations, there's a strong sense I, and that is usually accompanied or influenced by the sense there is this separate entity that controls minds and body that can actually be exchange if that was a tool possible you could actually exchange it uh, for someone else's set self that could possibly be identified without having to rely on mind and body you could identify the self leaving aside mind and body all right so best of all try to identify that sense of a self within yourself try and do that but of course then based on what you've learned so far well, remind yourself, well, if that is impossible. Where, where, where would that self be? What kind of self could be exchanged for the self of another person, first of all? Which self could actually enter another mind and body? Um, and how could it be identified without identifying my, mind and body? What can you say about this self without saying anything about mind and body? I mean, when I describe myself, I always describe mind and body or some mental qualities, some physical quality. So therefore, reflecting on that and reflecting, of course, on the fact that, well, as a merely labeled, yes, utilizer of mind and body, that's one thing. But in and of itself, being this utilizer of mind and body, that which uses mind and body, being that which um, controls mind and body as some separate controlling ent entity, although not independent of mind and body, but still separate, well, that is impossible. And so reflect on that and reflect on yourself, not having such a self, other sentient beings, not having such a self. And then, of course, combine it, bring it back to love and compassion, bodhicitta, then go back to wisdom. And so in that way, alternate between the two. So that's for the next uh, two weeks. Please do that. All right. Okay. Um, and then some questions. I said last time that Tao Seti had um, sent me some questions. Well, what he does is he also sends me little charts and, and uh, I don't know, diagrams that he prepares. So maybe if there's a way to make them available, maybe they're helpful to others. Um, it, it takes a while to get through them. And some of them I don't really understand myself all the way, but I do look at them and and think it's it's definitely helpful for anyone really to make these charts and get these diagrams because they're a really good way because uh, sometimes just drawings you know this is where this goes this is where that goes this is how they're connected and so forth so when I say charts and diagrams that's really what I mean so in order to help him understand well exactly that where does everything fit into how it's connected to everything else so um, yeah, if there is a way, I don't really know there is a way, but anyway, it's all with Dalit. And once her computer is working again, maybe she, there's a way to, yeah, make all I'll this available. I'll it next time. I will. Yeah, great. That's great. Thank you. And he sent this really nice picture. I really like that. That I can describe easily. The other uh, uh, kind of charts and diagrams, they're difficult to explain. But he, he sent this picture of a guy Actually, I think he's a Sikh, an Indian Sikh person who's an ex excellent writer, obviously, because he's riding on two horses, standing on two horses, basically, with one foot on one horse and with the other on the other foot and holding both. And then he wrote conventional truth on one tr on one horse and then ultimate truth on the other. And I guess us kind of riding the two horses. So I, I really like that. Um, so really, when we practice um do our practice in particular so we need both truth you nothing would work without the convention and the ultimate so really riding these two horses anyway i i, I definitely like that picture but then uh like going through these question i mean they're not really questions as such as just more statements but there's two things i i marked here so he says that he's actually been reading uh the book science and philosophy in the indian buddhist classics and here it talks about death, transference, transference from one life to the next, and rebirth as being neutral. Uh, it's from the Abhidharma. He says this on page 210. It's actually the second volume where it says that. And uh, he says, this is the analysis which I sent some time ago in which the deepest level one can reach is a neutral feeling. 
in empiric meditation level analysis, he writes in brackets. But actually, well, here, this is according to the Abhidharma, so it's Sutra, it's not Tantra. Tantra is different. In the, on the, in the, according to the Sutric level, so death, death is, is not, usually we think of death as, as stopping ours when we no longer breathe. So when our breath stops, when we stop breathing, or when, when I don't know, mind and body separate. Uh, but actually, in the sutric system, death is usually described as a very subtle mind that arises or that is present just before mind and body separate. That's death. And when mind and body separate, that is actually you've died. So that's no longer, you don't use the word death in the present, uh, but you use it as in like, well, the person has died, like you use the verb um, applying the, the, the past tense. Now, therefore, death being that subtle mind, yes, in the sutric system, that is neutral. Um, but you don't meditate. On that level, there's no meditation, simply because there's no meditation technique in the sutric system that allows you to access that mind and, and use it for, for meditation. While in the tantric system, as many of you probably know, that is described as the clear light mind of death. And from ordinary beings like someone like myself, not having any um not practicing um, tantra or anything in 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 that um, with regard to utilizing that mind. So therefore, I cannot utilize it. So in my case, it's neutral. But if someone is highly advanced or is advanced in their meditation practice, they can utilize it, and it can be virtuous. But like I said, in the sutric system, it's always um, it's considered to be neutral because we just can't access it. So it wouldn't be a meditation like a mind that meditates so tantra and sutra here are different and like i said the second volume or all these three volumes well no there's some tantric explanation given but um definitely it mentions clearly but on page 210 um of the second volume it mentions a quote i think it was from the abhidharma and that's definitely sutra and yeah so therefore in response to his question uh, or in response to his comment, I would say it's it's not a meditative state that is mentioned here. Um, so also he says that kind of citing uh, Zongsa Konsumshi on the basis of what Zongsa Konsumshi says to verse one and verse three in the eleventh chapter of Chantakirti's text, um, where Zongsa Konsumshi talks about this um, transforming or talking about. Um, bodhisattva on the first ground, being able to remember uh, events a hundred eons in the in the past and knowing events, or not just remember, I mean knowing events a hundred eons in the past and a hundred eons in the future. Now, John um explanation of that is that he, the bodhisattva has the ability to transform one moment into eons and, and eons into a moment. Now, that is an interesting way to, to um, interpret this explanation. Like, what does that mean? I mean, time is totally subjective. So for other sentient beings, I don't think a bodhisattva, a bodhisattva on that level would be able to transform an eon into uh, um, a, a moment and a moment into an eon. But for the bodhisattva's uh, perception, him or herself, that's a possibility. Anyway, um, it's it's an interesting um, kind of citation. I mean, he cites it here. He says it's on page 388. Well, if you've got the book by Zonsa Kensuram, which is actually on page 366, uh, that is printed in on the page numbers. But if you use like an electronic device, uh, what, it sh what shows up is 388. So anyway, um, whichever is 388 or 366, you may want to read this. And he and Tao City then says, on the basis of the self, um, we are time being. So this feeling of time, or no, one basis of the self is causal. We are time beings. When one is analyzing feeling of time itself and refuting itself is also refuted. Okay, never mind. But then, without a feeling of time, there's no self. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. Without a feeling of time, if you have no, um, and it, I take it further, like without any memory of who we are, what we've done. Of course, there's also no sense of identity and no sense of self. 
Um, so we definitely have a sense of time. Some animals definitely true, but in a limited way. And I don't know how that manifests, but for us as human beings, yeah. All right. Anyway, so this is more like a, a statement, I guess. So, uh, yeah, and everything else, I, I, I don't think I need to go into anything, anything else on that. Um, but yeah, very good. He gives it a lot of thoughts and his analysis, he uh, sometimes puts into words the way he did here. And then there's a question from um, Barda. Um, okay, I'll read the question. It's a little confusing, but I think I understand what she's talking about. So, uh, so what she says is, is and what is the connection, if any, between the way the mind designates an object because it is not any other object and the diamond slivers as posited by the Prasangika? Could the other object uh be any of the not i mentioned in the three diamond slivers all right let me just say what i think it's it's meant and then barda can disagree if i misunderstood so in loric in the explanation of mind as one of the basic topics that you usually study uh before you study more advanced topics of philosophy um, there's a description of the mental consciousness, the conceptual mind in particular, which functions such when you perceive an object, let's say I perceive a table, the mental consciousness, the conceptual mind thinking of a table, in that moment, that mind, it, it negates, it, it, it eliminates anything that is not table. So in that way, it gets at the table. So anything that is other than table is is eliminated so it's everything other than itself well that is eliminated in that way the mind perceives table okay but then on the other hand you have the diamond slivers you have the diamond slivers reasoning where it says the self is not one with itself it's not different or other than itself um no, sorry, the self is not, no, the self is not different, the self is not, uh, no, the self is not one, the self is not different, it's not both, it's not neither, and so forth. So is that the same here, like saying the self is not different, um, not different from other phenomena? Is that what this is meant? So this is how I understood this. But, but am I, yeah, is that correct? Is that your point? I just thought that if if by the lowering you say that whatever we designate we designate on the on the uh, on it not being the other stuff uh -huh. anything else mm -hmm. then then why do we need to like go further and further and say not like two not like okay. one okay 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 one, okay okay yes so what is meant in the case of the conceptual mind, Lorik, which is described in the, as part of the topic of Lorik, we study about the mind, like I said, what is meant uh, with regard to this particular uh, uh, situation is that when we perceive an object, the mind eliminates everything that is different from itself, different from itself, other than itself. But in the case of the diamond sliver, you eliminate not a self that is different from itself. That would make sense. But you take the two, mind and body, and the self. So what is their relationship? Saying, if the self exists, of course, it can only exist in relation to mind and body. All right? In Lodic, it's not talking about the, the basis of imputation and labeling. It's just saying anything that is not itself. Right, anything that we don't identify as table, that is excluded when you perceive table. So a very simple way of just saying how the mind works. Okay, it's not going into this depth of what is the table, right? How does the table exist as a table? That's not part of loading. It's not going into emptiness. It's just saying when we perceive a table, right? What I mean, it's really what it's saying is we're not perceiving the table directly. It's a conceptual mind. So if you don't perceive the table directly, you must have a sense of what table is because you don't have it right in front of you. So your memory assists you to now think of a table and your mind automatically 
refutes everything other than table. So it's like to the mind, if really all you're thinking of is table, it's almost like this table is like floating in space, right? Because you're not thinking of anything other than table. So it's like this isolated object, which you've isolated by way of eliminating anything other than table, right? That's all. That's just, that's all it's saying in logic, right? Just to introduce you to the idea, how does the mind perceive an object? But with the diamond sliver, there's this, 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 this reasoning that sets forth Pramana Bhartika, that's a whole different level. It is saying, well, now how does this table exist as a table? I understand how we perceive the table, okay, but how does the table actually exist? Well, how do you find out? In comparing it to parts the the parts it's made of what is it made of of a leg of a surface wood nails and so forth similar and so here really the diamond sliver is applied to the self but of course the same reasoning can be applied to the table and so forth so in the case of the self what is the eye what is the self i cannot talk of it separate from mind and body and therefore now you check is it one with its mind and body not one with itself or different from itself. That's different. That's That was what we dealt with before. No, is it different from its mind and body? Is it one with its mind and body? Is it both? Is it neither? So what it is different from is different here. You see, it differs. So in Lorik, this is how you per perceive the object as eliminating the mind, eliminated anything that was not itself. And in this case, you're asking, well, what is that thing itself? One with its aggregates and so forth, and one with its parts or not. That's the difference. So you're going deeper here. You're not just talking about the mind, how it perceives its object. You're looking at the object itself. How does it exist? Go ahead, Barda, does that help? I, 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 maybe after I've learned the diamond slivers, then what I learned in Loric sort of combines together. And then, and then I say, whatever is not this, the way that we have to see the table is, is the diamond slivers also. Mm, I, I don't think, yeah, I, I mean, you can combine it, but not in the way you described it here in your question. So, right, like the way I just said, like, anyway, Okay. Just write it out more if you have further questions, but it would be too would take too long to discuss now what you actually meant. But you're welcome to write it out again because maybe I just uh, yeah I probably didn't really understand fully what you tried no, you to did, say. But of course, but put, it, put, it, put your thoughts down again if you okay. want. Okay, for next time. Great. Now then, there's another one from Jimmy. So Jimmy asks from last class. The mind takes on the aspect of its object. I talked about that as part of one of the verses. You remember when someone questioned the Buddha realizing emptiness, how do you realize something that's just the negation of something? And in response to that, uh, Chandrakirti says, well, the mind takes on the aspect of emptiness. So what does that actually mean? I did mention briefly, it means the object appears to the mind. But maybe to give you an analogy or use an, exa use an example in everyday life is helpful. Can you think of an object that takes on the aspect of something? Well, a mirror, right? A mirror takes on the aspect of the reflection. I mean, it takes on the aspect, like let's say you have a mirror in front of a chair. Well, it takes on the aspect of the chair. The mirror, sorry, the chair appears in the mirror. We say in the mirror. We don't say to the mirror. Why don't we say the chair appears to the mirror? Well, because the mirror is not aware that something is appearing, right? We use the word, we use the, the preposition to, I hope it is a preposition, but anyway, we use the preposition to when we talk about a mind because something appears to it and that enables the mind to know it. But we can also say the chair appears in the mind just as it appears in the, as it appears 
in the mirror. So in the mirror, a chair appears in the mirror. Okay, so it's this, there's an appearance, basically, that is cast, that is taken on by that mirror, an aspect. He asks us the word aspect number. Yes, it's number. So it takes on the aspect. It's not the, it's not the table. It's not the chair itself. It's not the chair itself, but there's an aspect of the chair that is presented in the mirror. That's what it means, right? So it takes it on. It's like it, the, my, the, the mirror takes it on because it's now in the mirror, right? So the mind is like that. The mind in that mind, there's now a vase appearing. I mean, we all know that from our own experience. Even when you close your eyes and you think of a, oh, sorry, I, I said chair before. So using the example of the chair. So even when you close your eyes, a chair is appearing. And that is like your mind is now like a mirror. But your mind is like this magical mirror. Like think of an everyday kind of mirror that not only has something appear to it, but also knows what appears to it. It's kind of like this, this mirror that goes, ooh, look, this beautiful chair, I want that chair or whatever, right? So our mind is like a mirror, has that mirroring ability, which is why it's said it's clear. It's clear. Like Tibetans would say, a mirror to which something can appear, it's clear. It's a clear, it's something can appear to it. So it's, a, it's got this lum, clearness, clarity to it, this luminosity, because something can appear to it. You wouldn't really say that in English or in any other European language such. I don't think you say that. You say clear, a clean mirror, yeah. But not, it's not so much about something can appear to it, really. But in the Buddhist context, it's really like it's, the mind, is the, the mind is clear because it's like a mirror and that something can appear to it. So it takes on the, how does it, how does something appear in the mind? Because it takes on the aspect of that object, like a mirror. So he asked, therefore, um, that was his first question. And if our mind takes our body as its object, does our mind take on the aspect of our body? He says, take up. I would use the word take on the aspect, not take up the aspect. Take on the aspect of our body. Yes. Okay. Is this what we mean by body in the nature of mind? No, 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 no. Uh, in, in the nature of the mind, the body in the nature of mind, that's different. That's a whole different, that's, that's the, a body that is not made of coarse physical objects, but the subtler type of body, the nature of which is mental. That's a whole different type of uh, uh, body altogether. If you think of this gross, ordinary body, it's made of atoms, it's made of impure substances, uh, to use the Buddhist, Buddhist terminology. Well, that kind of body, it appears to our mind, it appears to others' mind, and those minds take on the aspect of that. Well, does it take up the aspect of our guru, of our teacher, of our lama? Well, yeah, the body at least. Um, surely whatever is in the sphere of vision, it takes that on, it appears to the mind. And then you've perceived Buddha Shakyamuni, yes, that as well. But there's, of course, a difference taking on the aspect. So in, in actuality, it's the, the body of Buddha Shakyamuni. But whether you know it is that body or not, that's a whole different discussion, right? Your mind takes on that aspect. And based on whatever appears to the mind, and of course, it's limited to each person, to one person, there's this incredibly charismatic body that appears. To a next person, there's this ordinary guy's person's, ordinary person's body appearing. But in actuality, something is appearing. So we're saying it's Buddha Shakyamuni's body appearing to that person, right? Does that make sense? So... What we what are we going to call it? Buddha's body, but it appears, of course, in different ways depending on the mind of the person, depending on the um, the, the mental the predisposition and so forth. I mean, to an animal, the Buddha appears different than to a human being, and then again to some beings because of their pure karma. It's like this pure radiant body. And to another person who doesn't have that karma, I perceive maybe like a very limited or ugly body. I don't know. But the point is, each person's mind takes on the aspect of the Buddha's body, but may not recognize uh, the mind itself doesn't necessarily recognize that it's the Buddha's body. Okay. So taking on the aspect just means to appear. Okay. 
but important question. It's an important question. So anyway, um, yeah, so that's it for today. And um, then also Tao City, he, he actually just sent some videos, a uh, very good video on uh, free will. I'm not going to go into this now. I watched it and I thought it was very interesting. And I was going to say something about free will, but now there isn't enough time. I'll do it next time. And he also very kindly sent us home this message for Vesak, for the Vesak day. Um, that is for um, Saka, Shaka, Saka, Saka Dawa, um, the Buddha's day of enlightenment, birth, and so forth. Okay, anyway, having spent some time on those questions, let's go back to the text. So we finished with verse um, 11, I think. No, wait. The Buddha takes some. No, no. Okay, 12. We did 12. 12 we did, we did 13, and we did 14 as well, I thought. 14 as well. Yep. So we, we got to verse 14, I think, to, uh, I seem to remember. So what did we learn? We learned, well, first of all, the Buddha's, the, um, wait, let me just go back to me, just to summarize, because last time I didn't have time to summarize. Okay, so we learned as it says in verse 10, well, the Bodhisattva has got a little bit work left, basically. He strives further on the ground that gives rise to the 10 powers, so makes an effort. The 10th ground Bodhisattva, the last level before you become enlightened, is the level of a 10th ground Bodhisattva. So then based on that, having reached that state, um, that is already um just compared to like a bright cloud this night sky like the bodhisattva on that level having the ability to reduce our ignorance and so forth well then the bodhisattva will then in the pure realm of akanishta will attain full enlightenment which is unrivaled all the greatest qualities are attained um, and then on that level the bodhisattva's mind and emptiness are of one taste all phenomena including well all phenomena, meaning ultimate and conventional truth, all phenomena are perceived by the mind simultaneously. So the mind realizes all phenomena, but also knows their emptiness because it's of one taste with suchness, which is indistinguishable in terms of all phenomena. I explained it extensively last time compared to uncompounded space or unconditioned space. Um, anyway, so but then there's this question if someone is arguing, well, emptiness is really just a negation of inherent existence. How can you take that as to mind? How can you perceive that with a mind? And if you can't do that, then there's no knowledge of such an object. And if there's no knowledge, there's no knower. So what is there to be taught? And in response to that uh, kind of um, challenge or that kind of objection, well, Chandrakirti said answers, uh, well, you still know an object, whether it's a, a, a mere negation of something. Well, it does exist and it's taken to mind. It's, 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 its aspect is taken on. It appears to the mind and it's known. It's known that lack of inherent existence is known by the mind in the same way as, you know, blue and so forth, other objects that also appear to the mind. All right. So that's the answer. And then in, on pay, on, on, in verse 14, um, we just we talked about that as well in terms of uh, how does the mind actually perceive something? I mean, if it's free from all obscurations and so forth, well, it's it's through this enjoyment body. That's the actual the person as the, we we don't with enjoyment body. We're not talking about the mind uh, of the Buddha, but really the Buddha as a person with mind and body. That is described as the enjoyment body. And that is sustained by merit. So by the prayers of the Buddha, but also by the merit of sentient beings. And from that spacious type of mind that's free of all obscurations without having any intention as such, um, no need, no, no, no planning or anything to teach anything, the mind just naturally, spontaneously teaches uh, the world, other sentient beings according to their needs and so forth. Uh, in order for them to realize suchness and, of course, then to become fully enlightened. And then this is how far we got last time. And then with verse 15 and 16, this is explained uh, in more detail because someone may wonder, how does that work? The mind of a Buddha is so different. 
how do you actually like have a mind and we discussed it uh, in detail last time if you have a mind that there's no conceptual thoughts the 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 wish i should do this and i should do that and making an effort this effort of spontaneous mind that knows all phenomena simultaneously how can it direct how can it be very specific in terms of what it teaches this person and another person that seems impossible according to our limited mind just trying to fathom that and so here he describes it he says the he just he, he compares it to um, a potter a potter with a with a with a potter wheel where you have this wheel that well first you set it in motion and once it's set in motion once it turns around well then it just keeps turning all right well, let's say you have this magical wheel that once it's you set it in motion it won't stop turning so it's a bit like that here so the wheel set in motion through long and strenuous labor by a strong potter. So let's say first you had to, I don't know, the wheels of the past. Nowadays, mechanically, you have these incredibly, I don't know, sophisticated um, wheels. I mean, they're electronic anyway. But here, think of this. It takes a while to get it moving. And once it's moving, that is now like enlightenment. So then it spins freely and pots are seen to be produced thereupon, even when no further immediate effort is made. All right. So the potter's okay. Now it's turning. It's spinning. No, no longer any effort, and and anything can be produced. Likewise, without exerting any immediate effort, without having to make any effort from the side of the Buddha, at least, thanks to his aspirations. So previously, this aspiration of prayers, these incredible aspirations, when the Buddha had a mind that was still aspiring, the, the force of those, the force of those, these were limitless prayers over and over for the benefit of sentient beings and such is the power of the mind even when it was limited by the obscurations but still the power was such that it created the causes and conditions for now the buddha being able to effortlessly produce not pots but produce teachings so you have that aspiration the force of that which is endless because it was directed towards endless sentient beings, endless sentient beings until the end of samsara. So in that sense, no limit to it. And one hand, that's from the side of the Buddha and from the side of the sentient beings, oh, merit, okay? The positive potential. So whatever we do in this world, there's always two sides to it, all right? When we help another person, we need the intention to do so and the other person needs to have the merit to be helped. If I want to kill someone, okay, me just having the wish to kill this person is not enough because the person needs to have the karma to be killed. So you always have those two sides. And that's reflected in here as well. From the side of the Buddha, this incredible aspiration, right? This aspiration, this incredible force there, and the merit from the side of particular uh, disciples. And then... The enlightened deeds of the one abiding in the Dharmakaya are inconceivable indeed. Okay, you've got the incredible knowledge. You have the knowledge of the mind. The Buddha is totally freed, so knows exactly what's best for anyone. The, the force of the aspiration of prayer, and of course the love and compassion, that as well, it's implied in here. And the merit of sentient beings, perfect combination. So from the side of the Buddha, couldn't be any better. And then from the side of the disciple, of course, no interest. Well, the Buddhas are there, but there's no interest. The Buddhas can't do anything, can't force anyone to listen to the Dharma and so forth. But anyway, here describes that effortlessness uh, by way of this, this wheel set in motion previous to the Buddha becoming enlightened and now this effortless kind of activity. All right, so those two verses I don't think are too difficult. Um, and then it goes on to say, now it describes the Dharmakaya. I talked about uh, these qualities of a Buddha. They're mental. Usually they're mental and physical. Those are the qualities. And usually the mental, of course, are stressed. And Dharmakaya is a word you've maybe many of you have heard, but it's really basically describing the mental qualities of the Buddha. So it's this mind of a Buddha. And of course, to a certain degree, I mean, also the emptiness of the mind of the Buddha, that's not a quality of a Buddha as such, like the emptiness was there in the beginning. But of course, based on the emptiness of 
what of the Buddha's mind that makes the emptiness of the Buddha's mind special because it's the emptiness of a particular object. So we even talk about the emptiness of the mind as a quality as such, but a natural quality. Um, it is described also in relation to understanding Buddha nature. So the emptiness of our mind is our Buddha nature. Remember, we, I think we discussed it briefly. So our, the emptiness of, of our mind is our Buddha nature. Well, in the sense, it, it, it enables us to become a Buddha. We talk about Buddha nature as that which we need to become a Buddha. So the fact that our mind lacks inherent existence that enables the mind to transform, okay? So, of course, it has certain other conventional qualities. It's free from the stains of, of ignorance and so forth. I mean, free in the sense its actual nature is not affected by that. But in terms of its emptiness, it is such that because it lacks inherent existence, that allows the mind to transform. And its lack of inherent existence becomes the object. So when we realize the lack of inherent existence of our own mind and other phenomena, then our mind, based on that understanding and the fact that it doesn't exist inherently, it can change. Okay? So that's why we call it our Buddha nature. And that emptiness persists all the way to the emptiness of the Buddha's mind. All right. So when it's called Buddha nature, when we're not a Buddha yet, that emptiness is called Buddha nature. Uh, well, it's a Buddha's quality once you have the mind of a Buddha. So that's also described, it's also part of the Dharmakaya. So the Dharmakaya can be divided into the wisdom Dharmakaya, that's the actual mind, and then the natural Dharmakaya. Well, natural in the sense of natural purity on one hand, so the net nature. Uh, dharmakaya, which is the lack of inherent existence of the mind, and then the dharmakaya in the sense of the absence, the, the absence of any kind of adventitious stains. Okay, I'm not really using the, um, the, the terminology, it's too confusing, but really it's the cessation, the absence of any kind of obscurations in the mind of a Buddha. Buddha has eliminated them, so now you have the absence of those. That is also part of the dharmakaya. So in other words, that pure mind, the Buddha's mind itself, and the reason for its purity lacks inherent existence, and it's free, it's pure in terms of having eliminated anything that's not in its nature. That is described as the Dharmakaya. All those are part of the Dharmakaya, okay? So burning away the tinder of all objects of knowledge. So whatever was in the way to realizing whatever objects of knowledge, whatever obscuration, Having burned that away, that is the mind itself has burned them away, there is a state of peace, state of enlightenment, the Buddha's perfect dharmakaya, all right? That's whether you talk of, it or talk, of it, talk of it from the point of view of the uh, cessation in the mind of the Buddha or the mind itself, the fact that the mind lacks inherent existence, all that, all these three, these three types of dharmakaya, if you like, well, all that is possible because all the tinders, all the obscurations were burned away, were eliminated. In such a state, there is neither arising nor cessation. Okay, so there's no, there's no, uh, there's neither arising from it. So you cannot rise from that. You always remain in that state. And there's no cessation of that state. You always remain in that state, in other words. Okay, so you always be, there's neither getting out of that exiting, like arising from it or any cessation. And with mind ceased, so there's no longer any conceptual mind. It is actualized by the body. Here it's the enjoyment body, the person. Who actualizes? Who actualized this body? Who got this kind? Who actualized this Dharmakaya, I should say? It is called the enjoyment body. It's not a body, it's a person actually. So in other words, to, to explain verse 17, a Buddha is someone who's totally eliminated all obscurations. The Buddha is someone who's in the state of peace, has attained the perfect Dharmakaya, the mind of a Buddha. 
free from inherent existence, but more importantly, free from any kind of obscurations, the Dharmakaya. And in such a state, you remain in that state. You no, you no longer arise from that for another mind to, to manifest, nor does it ever cease. That mind will always be present in the continuum of a Buddha. And now there is no longer any conceptual mind. There's no longer any thoughts. It's just a spontaneous mind that's not limited with regard to its object. So there's no conceptual mind that has ceased. So who actualized this? Well, what we describe as the enjoyment Buddha. The Buddha, the, the of course, conventionally existent person Buddha, who we describe as the Sambhogakaya, that is to say, the enjoyment body. All right, it's not the emanations. Is the Buddha him or herself, or it shouldn't even use a gender, you know, shouldn't specify the gender, but it's just not possible in English. But anyway, so the Buddha, let's say himself in this case. So the Buddha here is the enjoyment body who actualized all this. But of course, mainly labeled, the person Buddha being labeled on the basis of the mind, right? Manifesting also a certain body, which is the body of the enjoyment, enjoyment body. I mean, enjoyment body is really a person. It sounds like the enjoyment body is a body, but it's not a body, it's the person. It's defined as a person and so forth. And that's a particular type of person. So really when we think of previously the bodhisattvas, those were beings who there was the bodhisattva, let's say himself on the 10th, on the first ground, on the second ground, and so forth. And you may remember they emanated, they, they emanated out all these different uh, emanations, these different manifestations. And now the Buddha does exactly the same. But there's who is the Buddha who emanates out these emanations? These emanations are also Buddhas, they're part of that Buddha, but they're called emanation body. Okay, whatever emanation. So Buddha Shakyamuni, for example, was an emanation Buddha or an emanation body, I should say, to use the, the word. Um, he was an, a Nimanakaya or emanation body in the sense that as the Bodhisattva from the ten, first ground onwards was able to manifest not just as one person, but manifest different emanations of a Bodhisattva, a Buddha can do so even uh, more extensively, in that there is the actual person, Buddha, the actual person, Buddha, um, that is described as the enjoyment body, right, the Sambhogakaya, who has a Dharmakaya, that is the mind of a Buddha, um, has a, an enlightened mind together with, well, the lack of inherent existence together with the cessation of all obscurations. So you have that. And then that, that emanation body, sorry, that enjoyment body, that Buddha entity, that Buddha, now emanates out many different emanations body, emanation bodies or emanation Buddhas, if the word body is too um, confusing. All right. So Therefore, this is really describing the Buddha as a person and the Buddha as to his qualities, in this case, well, mainly mental, mental qualities, of course. Okay, so that's what it says here, therefore, in verse 17, I hope this has become clear. Um, yeah, and so I should say this enjoyment body has also certain uh, qualities, actually, usually five are described, five characteristics um, in that this particular emanation, where does it reside? Where is that, um, not this emanation, sorry, that particular enjoyment body, this actual Buddha, where does this actual Buddha reside? With a body, there's a body there, but it's not an emanation in the sense of emanation body, um, but such, it just has, it comes along with a body um, because, well, a Buddha always has a body, because without a body, no one could communicate with the Buddha. So the Buddha always manifests with a certain body. So even if it's the actual Buddha in the form of the enjoyment body, um, Sambhogakaya, it has to have a body because the Buddha always benefits sentient beings. So someone has to perceive the Buddha. 
So one of the characteristics is that it, it, it's perceived by bodhisattvas who've realized emptiness directly. So any bodhisattva who's reached the path of seeing onwards, any bodhisattva um, on the Mahayana path of seeing can perceive such a Sambhogakaya. So they, their mind has become so pure that they can perceive that particular enjoyment body. And it is also because it has a body, the enjoyment body, enjoyment Buddha, no, the enjoyment body has a body. Therefore, it's located somewhere. Where is it located? In the pure realm of Akanishta. I mentioned it last time, pure realm of Akanishta. And there the Buddha teaches only Mahayana Dharma, because it's for the, the, the other Dharma, because no one else can perceive them. The purest mind uh, of, of all the bodhisattvas, those who've realized emptiness directly on the path of seeing onwards, those have the purest mind in terms of their method and wisdom aspects of their mind, and therefore they can perceive this bodhisattva. So all they need is Mahayana teachings. This is why Sorry, not bodhisattvas. So these bodhisattvas, they can perceive this Buddha. They are the only ones who can perceive this Buddha. This is why this Buddha, this Sambhogakaya, or enjoyment body, only teaches Mahayana. Okay, so it's the place is Akanishta, the, this, the retinue, that is those around the disciples, are bodhisattvas on the path of seeing onwards. Uh, the, the teachings are Mahayana teachings. And the Buddha manifests with a body, with all the signs and, and marks of an enlightened being. Another you know, list of them. Um, and so that's the quality in terms of the, the, the signs of the body, not the body. And then the characteristic of time is forever, as long as there's samsara. As long as samsara, this is this is however long there be samsara for that long the Buddha will remain. Those are the five characteristics of this enjoyment body in Akanishta. Always there with all the signs, marks and signs of the Buddha with Mahayana uh, Ar uh, Arya Mahay no, uh, Mahayana Aryas, that is um, Bodhisattvas who've at least reached the path of seeing, the Mahayana path of seeing. Um, I've mentioned the place, yeah, the place, the time, the body, place, the time, the body, the retinue, and body. Yeah, I think those are the, anyway, you can easily uh, Google them, the five characteristics of an enjoyment body or Sambhogakaya in case you got confused. But those are the qualities of such a Sambhogakaya. And then that body radiates out. All right. So if you then look on page 18, if you check out, not page, Verse 18, it says, this body of peace, radiant like the wish-granting tree. So this is like the uh, body. I mean, again, it's not the body, it's the person. So this person, the body of peace described here. So the Buddha, the enjoyment body, the Sambhogakaya, in Akanishta, surrounded by Arya Bodhisattvas and so forth. It's like a wish-granting tree, resembles the wish-granting jewel that without any forethought, without any intention, without any planning, grants riches of the world to beings until they gain freedom. It will be perceived by those free of conceptual elaboration. So this enjoyment body, the state of peace, that Buddha, um, now radiates out, emanates out different manifestations or manifests different emanations like a wish-granting tree or like a wish-fulfilling jewel that doesn't need any intention. It's like it's this mystical kind of, um, yeah, kind of object or, or jewel um, that manifests whatever beings wish for. So here, the emanations, these different Buddha emanations or the Nimanakaya, that is the, uh, the emanation bodies, they're now sent out spontaneously according to beings' needs and so forth. Um, but it itself, that emanating entity, which is the Buddha himself, of course, based on the mind, but there's still this person, this enjoyment body, this Sambhogakaya, um, that will be perceived only by those free of conceptual elaboration 
when it comes to realizing emptiness. That means Arya bodhisattvas. When they realize emptiness, there's no conceptual elaboration when they realize emptiness directly because it's a non-conceptual mind that realizes emptiness. So those free of conceptual elaboration refers to bodhisattvas who've at least, who've reached the path of seeing at the very least where they, well, realize emptiness directly. <coughs> so in other words, therefore, what does this verse tell us? Verse 18, um, that there's this specific entity of the Buddha who spontaneously emanates different manifestations, um, but he himself can only be perceived by Arya Bodhisattvas. Okay. And then, all right, the next verses, and I'm, I'm speeding it up a little bit because this, well, what I just said so far, I don't think it's difficult to understand. That's just an explanation of the different qualities of the Buddha or the different ways in which the Buddha manifests. And of course, um, the emanations have not been discussed, but they're discussed now. Now the Buddha displays, it says in verse 19, within a single instant and within a single causally concordant form body. Okay, so here this means form body is just another way of saying a Buddha together with his body. Okay, that's a form body. So the enjoyment body, the Sambhogakaya, the actual body in Akanishta, having these five qualities I just described, now displays different other causally concordant form bodies, other form bodies, other Buddhas with bodies, which are causally concordant, they're in accordance with the Dharmakaya and the enjoyment body. So it's not like some limited emanational manifestation. No, it's this enlightened being that is now manifested in different ways. Like I said before, it's a little bit beyond our capacity to really understand that you could really, you, if you were enlightened, could emanate out all these Buddhas that are also enlightened beings, but that are emanated out by you. So they're not separate from you. It's like, it's difficult enough to be one person. How can you emanate out these other people? Like I said, we just need a little bit getting used to these ideas. But this is how the Buddha, therefore, benefits other sentient beings. So now how does he manifest those? He manifests all these emanations Parts of what he did in the past, for instance. So the Buddha displays all his activities, everything the Buddha has done in the past in the form of different Buddhas. The Buddha manifests what other beings have done. So all these different emanations, right? I mean, basically what this means in the, from verse 19 to verse 22, what really Chandakirti is saying here from 19 to 22 it's talking about the Buddha displaying all his own activities, everything he's done so far within a single pore of his body, which is really saying each pore of his body can emanate out. So think of an enjoyment body. Of course, it doesn't have ordinary pores like we do, but it's just kind of like saying any part of his body, however tiny it is, can emanate out these beings, which some of them, manifest the activities the Buddha has gone through himself. In that, what a better teaching than to emanate everything the Buddha has done, all this hard work, uh, work as a Bodhisattva, for instance, just manifesting that for other sentient beings. I mean, teaching, of course, but teaching not just through his words, but teaching through his own example. So Buddha Shakyamuni, think of Buddha Shakyamuni. Buddha Shakyamuni was just an emanation of an enjoyment body emanating out Buddha Shakyamuni and showing us how Buddha Shakyamuni practiced. And at some point, the Buddha who emanated Buddha Shakyamuni, when that Buddha was a bodhisattva, of course, went through these things, right? But now manifesting them in the form of Buddha Shakyamuni to inspire us and manifesting not just in our world, manifesting those in other worlds as well. That sounds like, oh, such a fairy tale. Oh my God, like, oh, my whole life doesn't seem, I don't see any Buddhas. I don't know, like, other worlds, are you kidding me? But like I said, that's just because we're so used to just 
you know, with our blinders to kind of perceive things in a certain way, it's very difficult to, to think along these lines. And of course, we're running out of time again, and I need to stop it here. Um, so I like what I like to say is at the very end, so we've been introduced now to the most difficult aspect to really fathom it's like these buddha's qualities and emanations and dharmakaya and all this well in the meditation we'll have time to kind of go over it again uh, but what i can say is this sometimes we look around people and like i look around people like for instance only being interested in soccer football and soccer and the whole life just revolves around these 11 guys that you know one guy shoots it in the goal and then they're so happy and when that doesn't happen you know they're terribly depressed so their whole life is just that's the whole world and when they hear about maybe buddhism or you know that's like what is this this got nothing to do with reality well we're a bit like that when we encounter these things we're like these oh just our whole life revolves maybe around this soccer team, our own life really, but there's so much more, there's so much more. And it takes some time for our mind to grasp the enormity of what is possible with our own mind, what is possible for other sentient beings um, to go beyond that limited sense of who we are and what is possible. And this is Actually, the time I spend with it is really not enough. I mean, I really, what Chandakirti is conveying here is this vastness, this possibility. And of course, to inspire us, wow, we have everything we need to do this. Now, we've got the emptiness. That has been explained in, in, in great detail. We need to meditate on this and understand that in order then to bring our mind in that direction. That's what we're aiming for, this vast abilities these vast abilities, that's what we are aiming for, right? And it's so hard to get a sense of it. I compared it last time, you remember, I said we're like a blind person who's never been able to see in this life, being blind since birth, and we're really desperately trying to understand what is red, what is blue, what is yellow. Oh, it's it's, it's mind-boggling. And still, if that is the goal to, if that helps us to be no longer blind, it's worth it right? So I think of a blind person, understanding what blue is and all that, and then having the aspiration to become, well, enlightened, that is to be able to see if that is the goal. Well, we make all the effort to really get some understanding, to then have the determination. I want that myself, not just for my own benefit, but driven by this love and compassion for others. It's going to be a lot of work, but it's totally worthwhile. All right. Anyway, Let's leave it at that and let's do a meditation. I won't be able to do it for very long because it's my dad's birthday today and they've been celebrating since four o'clock and it's already late. So it's like I'm going to be the last person arriving there. So I can't do it for too long. Um, anyway, just for those who will leave in between, I we won't have class uh, next week. I'm extremely busy, so I won't have we won't have class. This is the last time I cancel it until the end of this course. And from then onwards, unless something, whatever happens, but you, the plan is not to cancel class again. All right. So thank you for that. And then we'll have a quick meditation. Starting with some breathing. Just focusing on the breath and letting go of any confusion, any disruptive thoughts. So now think that However limited our existence, our body and mind may be right now. The fact that we have this mind lacks inherent existence.
and can therefore remove all the obscurations that are not in its nature. Accounts for our future enlightenment. And once we have freed our mind, from all its obscurations, our mind will become a Dharmakaya, a wisdom body. Sorry, truth body. So the our enlightened mind is a dharmakaya or truth body in that it's totally free from anything that is not in its nature. And it realizes all phenomena. At the same time, we also realize or attain the cessation, the absence, all obscurations. And the emptiness of this mind. Which are also truth bodies or dharmakayas. It is Therefore, the mind of a Buddha, the cessation of that mind and its emptiness. That are all dharmakayas and are mainly responsible for benefiting other sentient beings. But how? Since neither the mind of the Buddha nor its cessation can be directly perceived by anyone but a Buddha.
well. It's through the enjoyment of the body and the emanation of the body. The Dharmakaya benefits sentient beings. The enjoyment body being the actual Buddha attained the Dharmakaya and manifests a body with five characteristics. And which benefits Bodhisattvas who've at least attained the path of sin. But that is not enough. Therefore, the Enjoyment body emanates out, endless emanations for all those who can not perceive a, the enjoyment body. And those are the emanation body, Sava Buddha. Manifesting effortlessly like a potter's wheel set in motion. Due to the aspirations made as a bodhisattva. and the merit or positive potential of sentient beings. Could there be anything more meaningful to strive for? And these bodies of Buddha So to conclude this short meditation, spend a moment focusing on whatever insight you've gained. Let's dedicate the virtue we've accumulated, the positive potential. May that too become a cause for us one day to spontaneously emanate Buddhas in such a way that they're most beneficial to all sentient beings. So that we can lead all sentient beings to full enlightenment.
but may the merit we've accumulated also cause our lamas, like his holiness the Dalai Lama, and all the other great masters to have a long and healthy life. And may our merit also help all ordinary sentient beings in this world, those who are sick like Geshe Punzok and Tali Lubin and everyone else suffering from war, natural disasters and so forth, may all their sufferings be reduced and be eventually completely pacified. And of course, let's dedicate the way Shantideva does. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merit. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. All right, sorry for that um, kind of rushed ending. Uh, anyway, you know what to do for this coming, those two weeks, okay? It's bodhicitta, and then bring in your understanding of emptiness as far as much as you can. But, but bodhicitta comes to your understanding of what is enlightenment? What does it mean? How is it effective? Really spend some time going over this again, using the text, of course, because otherwise our aspiration to become enlightened will not be really sincere. And then bring it together with wisdom, what we discussed in the beginning, the lack of a self-sufficient, substantially existent self, the way I described it, there is no self that is a separate entity that utilizes or controls the self, that there is no self that can actually be exchanged or that can be identified without identifying mind and body. And to focus on that, sentient beings don't have such a self and we ourselves wishing to become enlightened don't have such a self. All right, so I wish you've very good two weeks <laughs> two weeks this time so i'll see you not next sunday but the week after that be well thank you thank you thank you, thank you, thank you uh, enjoy your party thank you, party. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.